Welcome to the spirit world, answering your questions on angels, demons, and how the spiritual and physical worlds interact. And now your hosts, Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. Well, hello there, and welcome to the spirit world. I am Debbie Giorgiani with co-host religious demonologist Adam Bly, and we hope you stay tuned in the entire hour because you hopefully are going to learn something new today. And uh, during the month of May, which is the month of Mary, we are going to be talking about Mary's role in spiritual warfare. But before we get started, Adam, we always begin with the St. Michael prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Adam. And before we get started on the teaching of the Blessed Mother's role in spiritual warfare during the month of Mary, May, so see... Uh, folks, this is, this is why we are addressing this, so that you can understand Mary's role um, a little bit better. Uh, but before we get going with the teaching, Adam, I just wanted to give the phone number because we are live today, so we expect your phone call. Um, so please, you can call in. Uh, try to stay on topic, okay? And we're talking about the Blessed Mother today. But if you do have a question about angels or demons or anything in between, um, if, if, it, if it is appropriate, we will happily answer. Um, answer that or comment on it. Um, or we will push you um, just one week, Adam, because we have our monthly open forum and mailbag show next Saturday. So just keep that in mind, folks. But we are live today. So let me give the phone number before we dive into uh, Mary's role in spiritual warfare. 877-757-9422. That's 877-757- 9424. Okay, Adam. All right. So, you know, uh, first off, when we talk about spiritual warfare, kind of in any part of it, I think it's helpful, Deb, to go back and understand what spiritual warfare is, because I'm noticing a trend that concerns me kind of in the Catholic world and, and social media right now, where people think spiritual warfare is just deliverance and exorcism prayers and the kind of exciting uh, combative prayers, but it really isn't. So I want to just briefly run through this before we get to Mary's role. First off, when we are baptized, we are baptized out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God. We are made a child of God, and we also receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit in that baptism. So in terms of spiritual warfare, what greater uh, step, what greater event can we experience than bat being baptized out of the kingdom of Satan and made a child of God? So we, we need to remember the importance of that sacrament. Then confirmation. This is when we make a, a, a kind of a thoughtful free will choice to accept our role in the Christian life. And here we receive the Holy Spirit again in a special way, and we see an activation of the gifts that we received at baptism. Then the Eucharist, super important for us Catholic Christians and, and those Christians that, that uh, have a, a form of that uh, in their life, though I think the Catholic understanding is the only that is the full understanding. Through the Eucharist, there is great spiritual warfare in the form of any and all blessings that you need at that time, the gifts that you need at that time, the healing that you need at that time. The Eucharist is everything that is necessary for each person. And we want to be receiving that weekly at least and on the Holy Days of Obligation, but it's wonderful if you can receive it more often. Okay. Marriage, sacramental marriage is a form of spiritual warfare. Why? Because one of the things that you're committing to in a sacramental marriage is to get the other person, your spouse, to heaven. You are to fight to get each other to heaven. That means help each other, support each other, help guide each other. Okay. Holy orders. When, we, when the church makes priests, deacons, anybody that's ordained, 
that is bringing more of God's power and authority through the church into the world, and it is enabling things like the sacrament of penance when we go to confession to happen and for the mass to happen and, and on and on. So holy orders is actually a form of the church militant. It's a huge part of the church militant, which is the church that is waging the spiritual war with the kingdom of darkness. Okay, then the anointing of the sick can't forget about that. Super important. This is right before we go to our judgment. Most most priests do the apostolic pardon after the anointing of the sick, which brings about a forgiveness of sin and mortal sin in particular that could have led us to being damned. So this is a great form of spiritual warfare where a soul can be snatched away from the perils of hell at the last moment by the authority of the church super important. And then finally, confession. For us lay people that are living in the world, confession is so important. And Deb, I, you know, we've talked about this before. I see it so much in, in the world of exorcism. When a sin is confessed, the demon that's laying claim to that person for that sin, it no longer lays claim based on that ground. It is completely gone. And so confession you know, and and sometime in the future we'll unpack confession a little more, is not to be uh, forgotten, it's not to be dismissed. You can't just confess in your own mind or your own words between God. The sacramental confession is really necessary. Okay. Now that's like the foundation of the pyramid that most of us forget, right? We don't want to do the work of going to church. We don't want to go through the uncomfortable confession. Um, you know, we don't often want to do the things that are our part of the Christian life, but we need to. Those are critical. Once you have those in place, now you can start talking about deliverance prayers, healing prayers, exorcisms. We shouldn't just jump to oh, I think I have this problem and I need a special priest to do special deliverance prayers to wave a magic wand and it'll take everything away. We got to remember the foundation of that pyramid is for us to do our part. Okay. And in addition to those sacramental um, things that we just talked about, of course, there's a layer of prayer there, right? So our, our regular prayer life is also feeding into our own deliverance, our own healing, and even for the person that's possessed exorcism. Okay. So we then put on top of that deliverance prayer, which is essentially asking Jesus to, to free a person of a problem or to heal them. It's usually an intercessory prayer. Lord, please help this person. Okay. It's usually not done as a command. Healing prayers, wonderful for actual, you know, healing of physical issues. There are masses for, for healing, these types of things. Those can be done. You can say those types of prayers to Jesus and ask that. Anybody can do that through their baptismal priesthood. But when we get to exorcism, of course, we're relying on the authority of the church, and the church's law regulates that. So only a priest can be doing that. So nobody can be doing exorcisms if you're not a priest with permission from your bishop to do it. Okay, here's another piece, Deb, and I see this as a real problem right now. A lot of people are looking at videos or reading websites, getting themselves worked up and scared, and they don't have somebody personally to work with them and give them some guidance on theology, on a proper understanding of sin, a proper understanding of, you know, what is oppression, what is a curse, these types of things. It's really critical to work with your local priest when you're seeking deliverance prayer, healing prayer. And of course, if it's exorcism, you're, you're working with the pastoral center of, of your diocese and your bishop is going to be approving that if they approve it. Okay. I know that's a lot, Deb, and we ran through it fast, but it's, it's something to remind people of. Now, on top of that, in addition, we can ask the figures in heaven to give us some help. And by figures in heaven, I mean angels, saints. Um, we talk to Jesus, of course. He is part of the Trinity, and he's at the right hand of the Father. We can also appeal directly to the Father, to the Holy Spirit. But a lot of times we are asking saints and Mary in particular to help us. Why is that? Because they're there in heaven before God. They can appeal directly to God. And Mary, out of all the saints, has a particular role because of her closeness with Jesus. You know, not only her immaculate conception, she was perfectly clean from sin because, of course, Jesus, God, would come into the world through a person whose body and soul was completely free of sin because how could God and sin coexist, which is what would be happening if Mary had any sin in her as he was growing in her womb. Okay, so 
Mary's yes to Jesus, her obedience to God, makes her special in heaven. Jesus giving us Mary as our mother at the cross when he said to John, behold your mother, and said to her, behold your son. He gave us her as a mother, and so there is a particular role that she has to intercede for us. Okay, then let's get to, Deb, how do we ask Mary for help? And this this is where the, the kind of the, the rubber meets the road. One that's really important, and you've told me so many times, and, and you've researched this, the power of the rosary. The meditation, the rosary is a meditation on the story of her son, okay? Mary always points to her son. She doesn't say, worship me. She doesn't say, I'm the one that's going to save you, that I'm important. Every time uh, there's been approved apparition, she always points to her son in prayer. So the rosary is a meditation on the story of her son. It brings about great graces. Now, I've used the rosary many times in heavy deliverance situations or in exorcisms. And I think after the break, because I'm hearing the music come in, I'll give you one of those examples, and then we'll talk about other ways we can appeal to Mary. Okay, that sounds great, Adam. And this is wonderful. We're talking about the Blessed Mother's role in spiritual warfare. Please join us. We are live today, 877-757-9424. Don't forget to like us on Facebook at The Spirit World Podcast. Okay, but please join us by phone today. We are expecting your call here on The Spirit World. Stay with us. Are you feeling lost in a sea of overwhelm? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Many people find themselves challenged with overwhelm. Too many things to take care of, too many people to please, too much work to do. And in spite of their best efforts, they continue to fall behind with this overwhelm coming in like a flood. But that's not the abundant life that Jesus wants you to live. That's why Stand Tall Today has experienced professional coaches that will assist you in dialing down that overwhelm. They'll help you get a grasp on where you are and create a plan that enables you to take bite-sized steps of action so you can live an abundant life. Why not take your first step right now? Go to StandTallToday.com and find a coach that is just right for you. Because life is simply too short to stay lost in a sea of overwhelm. This is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. This is Lavinia Spirito for Catholic Way Bible Study. St. John Paul II called for a new evangelization, an act of love meant to reintroduce all the faithful to the love of Jesus Christ. This act of love has never been more urgent. In his work, The Judgment of Nations, historian Richard Dawson notes, The hope of the world rests in the last resort, on the existence of a spiritual nucleus of believers who are bearers of the seed of unity. If we have faith in the power of the Spirit, we must believe that even these evils can be conquered. For the powers of the world are blind powers which are working in the dark. They are powerless against that Spirit who is the Lord and giver of life, and against those higher powers of spiritual understanding and love which are the essential gifts of the Holy Spirit. The battle for the world is first and foremost spiritual. Are you ready for battle today? Catholic Way Bible Study. Peace, power, purpose. Find out more at cwbs.org. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. Mary 
Christ's role in spiritual warfare. That's what we're talking about today on The Spirit World. Um, We have full phone lines. Uh, We always look at the positive side of things here on The Spirit World. And so uh, that's a good problem to have. However, we don't have a back waiting area for like a green room area for you to come on air with us. So you may get a busy signal. If you do, please just wait about five minutes and call back. Okay. Cause we'd love to hear from you or better yet, you can send us an email. If you'd like to put it in an email, it's T S W. Okay. That stands for the spirit world at G R N that's Guadalupe radio network, G R N online Dot com And it comes right into our show team. Taylor Van Est is our producer. Tim Mott is at the controls. Uh, Carol is, is call screening. This is amazing. We have the best show team, I think, um, here at Guadalupe Radio Network. So Adam, pick up where you left off and uh, we really should get to the phones because um, we just got word that there are people waiting to come in on the second group already. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'll kind of run through this, but it is important. So we were we were at the rosary as a way that we can appeal to Mary for help in spiritual warfare. The, the rosary is super important. You don't need to say it with a particular intention, though you can. When I have used it in cases where I'm working with a possessed person in between exorcisms, I'm usually the contact person if they're having a crisis during the week, that type of thing, and they ask for prayer. Uh, I will simply pray the rosary uh, with an intention in my mind for that person to receive the help that they need. And it's uh, super effective. And for the day-to-day life, just say a rosary a day. Uh, It'll be wonderful for your spiritual life in general. Okay, next way we can appeal to Mary. We can appeal to the promises that she has given us. There are a number of apparitions of Mary, approved apparitions, where Mary has made particular promises. She has made promises of protection against demons if we honor her under the title of Our Lady of Sorrows. And so we can look into that. We can look into bringing an image of Our Lady of sorrows into our home. We can meditate on uh, the sorrowful mysteries, as we say, the rosary, these type of things. There's also promise, beautiful promises, and you all can research this later through the brown scapular, through the green scapular, through the miraculous metal. Uh, There are a number down through the years, so we can appeal to specific promises that she has made from heaven uh, when we give this kind of um, devotional um, acknowledgement to her and these make these requests by honoring these sacramentals. Okay. Now, the last part is, and this is real simple, but it's subtle. We can just ask her to be our mother and to help us when we're dealing with something. Just talk to her like you would talk to Jesus. And I would just, you know, emphasize we want to ask in humility and obedience because those are Mary's two kind of central traits. Um, which is partly why she opposes the the demons so much, because they're about pride and disobedience. Mary is about humility and obedience. And then finally, we can do a consecration to Mary. And there's a few out there. St. Louis de Montfort is probably Mm -hmm. the most famous of those. And if people are interested, you can just um, do a Google search on St. Louis de Montfort consecration to Mary and get that book and and work through it that way. Do you have any comments, Deb, on those? Um, Just that I love the consecration to Mary and um, I love St. Louis de Montfort. The, it, there's so you're absolutely spot on. There's so many um, uh, resources out there and books and pamphlets uh, to do the consecration. And I think it's 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 definitely something that people should turn their attention to, especially during these times we live in. I just wanted to comment. Everything you said was spot on, uh, accurate, and well delivered, Adam. Um, I just wanted to add that Padre Pio once said, "Some people are so." F- foolish that they think they can go through life without the help of the Blessed Mother. By word and deed, Padre Pio taught that those um, who were close um, to him, those that were, uh, Padre Pio taught those who were close to him to pray continually for Mary's intercessory help. If I could talk today, that would help. So let me, let me just go back and say this. People that were close to Padre Pio knew how close he was to the Blessed Mother, even as a small child, very at the beginning of his life. And so he would constantly say, bring her into everything, you know, ask her to be a part of everything. And it's, and it's foolish if you don't, because the graces are there. 
and she is willing to help. She loves us more than anything. She's our spiritual mom. I love that. And Padre Pio was spot on about that. So um, just just keep that in mind, folks, because we always go to the saints, you know, their lives and what they have um, what they have walked, we can um, use as role models, right, Adam? And it's very important that we, especially Padre Pio, who had such an advanced um, spiritual life. So um, folks, please, we, we're taking this seriously this month because it is the month of Mary. So we do have f- full phone lines. And so Adam, if, if it's okay with you, let's pause with, uh, okay, some more of the teaching and then we'll go right to the phones. And up first is Marie. And Marie is in Seattle, Washington, listening on our friends at Sacred Heart Radio. Hello, Marie. Welcome to the spirit world. What's your question or comment? Hello, Marie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, welcome. Okay, awesome. Hi, um, so my father just passed away a couple months ago, oh. and at, at the time of his death, I was really praying that Mary would be there to be holding his hand, and so I, my question is, what's her role at that point of death? Is she taking him to Jesus? Is there a little war going on between heaven and earth at that point for my father's soul? I just really want to know. Right, Marie. So when we die, to be out of the body is to be with our Lord, as Paul teaches us. So we go immediately to our judgment. And so there's that interaction with Jesus where where we go through our particular judgment, um, you know, of our life, our sins, our charitable acts, and all of that. So you don't need to worry about any type of struggle. It is completely up to Jesus. Jesus owns all of our souls. God owns our souls, and it is up to God what happens to them. Now, Mary may, you know, be present to comfort somebody, particularly if they had a devotion to Mary. Some people have experienced her, um, you know, right before their death, but it's not like she's necessary to take him to Jesus. He would just be there immediately. Oh, awesome. That makes gives me peace in my heart. Thank you oh, so wonderful. much. Sure thing. We're so sorry for your loss, and I just made a note. Do you, do you want to give us your dad's first name? My dad's, my papa's name is Ben. Ben. Beautiful. When did he pass, Marie? Um, two months ago. Two months. How are you, uh, how are you doing? Day. Um... We're okay. We're okay. The funeral was beautiful and everything, but you know, we have moments. Mm -hmm. I have moments. And so I just go to daily mass while I feel, I feel closest to him there. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And, and, and just know that you now have a bigger uh, family around you praying for your, your family and your dad um, for the repose of his soul. And also, you know, keep that connection when you go to mass. Remember that as, as I do that all the time with my mom and it really does bring a sense of peace and, and you can feel the connection. You actually can, if you, if you stay aware that that is actually happening because your dad is alive more now in Christ than he ever was walking this earth, Marie. So yeah, blessed. thank you so much. That helps me a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Call us again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful call. Okay, so um, you can now start dialing 877-757-9424. That is the number to get on the spirit world. We're talking about the Blessed Mother's role in spiritual warfare. We just heard from Marie in Seattle, and now we will um, move to, um, let's go to Deacon Paul. Deacon Paul is in uh, Santa Barbara, uh, California, beautiful area of the country. Hello, Deacon. Hi, good morning. How are you both doing? Great. Good. How are you? Good, good. Uh, my question was that uh, I've dealt with a lot of the Latin community, uh, especially with the relationship of Santa Muerta, the uh, skeleton, uh, supposedly the related to the Blessed Mother, which is not a, a true uh, fact. And the thing is they try to pass the Blessed Mother as part of the Santa Muerta, which is no relationship. If he can, if Adam, if you can expand on that, I would really appreciate it because there's a lot of people that are very confused and are also drawn to it because of the falsity of that relationship that they uh, supposedly uh, think uh, that there is. Sure. That's that's a uh, really good comment, Deacon. I appreciate it. So, yeah, Santa Muerte, a lot of people won't be familiar with it. You may have maybe seen a headline about it. It is one of the cartel cults um, that came up from Mexico. It is a uh, kind of a 
I guess you could call it a religion, where people appeal to uh, Santa Marte means saint death. So they're appealing mm -hmm. to kind of a skeletal death figure uh, for help and protection in doing criminal activity and getting away for away with it and not getting killed themselves. And so it's it's really only uh, a spiritual figure that you appeal to to help you drug deal, harm others, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and not not get caught, not get killed yourself. And what they do is they, they have this literal skeleton in the imagery of the statues kind of draped and kind of looking like similar to what we would see as images of Mary in terms of her mantle, you know, her head being covered. But of course, it's not Mary. And there's a long history of other cults taking Catholic symbols or statues and worshiping other figures but using those statues or those images. It's kind of stealing or um, deceptively trying to take on legitimacy by seeming to be associated with that. Um, this cult has crossed the border and is in a number of cities in the country. Uh, sometimes it's very small and private. I don't think, I've not, at least not heard, maybe Deacon, you know, if there's actual formal churches in the States. I bet there's a few. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty bad stuff. So I don't want to get into the details of it because it's all pretty ugly. But but it is essentially a cartel cult. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate the information. Sure. And God bless you too. Thank, thank you, you, Deacon. God bless you. Thank you. Have, bless have a beautiful. You. Okay, have a beautiful weekend. Uh, real quickly, I wanted to add that we just had this sent in by. Uh, Gigi, um, Father Michael Gately's um, amazing uh, consecration book, 33 Days to Morning Glory, a do-it-yourself retreat. It is amazing. Um, I agree with Gigi. Thank you for sending it in. Uh, we will definitely have that as one of the resources for our Spirit World listeners. Okay, um, real quickly, we had uh, Peggy was going to be up next in South Carolina, but Peggy, unfortunately, either you had to hang up or it dropped, the call dropped. Peggy, if you'd like to call back, we will put you at the at the front of the line because you were waiting so patiently. The number to dial is 877-757-9424. Okay, so Peggy, please call back. It sounded like you had an interesting uh, question or comment. Okay, so let me take a look at anything else you wanted to share, um, Adam, before we move move forward. No, no, let's take the next caller. Okay, we will go to Rich in Queens, New York, um, and Rich is waiting so patiently. Not sure how you're listening, probably on EWTN. Hi. Hello, Rich. Hey, how you doing, Deb? Hi, Adam. Hey. Hey, so, yeah, I'm listening on EWTN radio. Um, so nice. my question is, how do, I, how do I best cultivate or develop a good relationship or working relationship with my guardian angel? Because I'm... Right now, what I'm doing is I'm on, I'm on my eighth day of my um, novena to my guardian angel, and I just okay. want to make sure that I'm actually involving him. How do I best involve him in my daily sure. life throughout the sure. day? So do I, do, how do I communicate with him best? Yeah, yeah. You know, well, so that the, he is a part of my life. Absolutely. Great question. We get asked that all the time, Rich. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked it because now uh, others are listening and it could benefit them as well. Um, the, the easiest way to bring your guardian angel into your spiritual life is, is just the sense of awareness that your guardian angel has a mission given by God himself um, to really assist uh, you in getting to heaven, right? To be your soul guard, your body guard, you know, to walk with you, to to pray with you, to really be there as, as a, a rooting for you to get closer to God. Psalm 91 is a fabulous Psalm in, in the Bible to meditate on because it's God's protection. Okay. And in, and midway in the Psalm is the, is the part about the, the truth of the angels, um, being there for you, Rich. And you remember your angel is, a, is assigned to you, you know, no one else. It's not like your, your guardian angels getting recycled to somebody else or they, they'll, they go back to God and say, you know, I'm kind of tired of Rich, yeah. you know, can I have somebody else? Right. So it's really important. <laughs> <laughs> it's really important that you, you know, you, you know, that and are aware of that. The easiest, absolute easiest way is the simplest prayer, the guardian angel prayer that we learned as children. 
That is rec- that yeah. perfect. Perfect. You know, yeah. as kids, I all Adam. I don't know if this happened to you, but it happened to me when I was growing up. We learned that guardian guardian angel prayer, and it was like a cute prayer. It was like real cute. You know, everybody always said, "Oh, what a sweet prayer!" It's a powerful prayer. Okay, because you're acknowledging their role, their mission. And, and God is, is very big on that. He wants us, every, all his creatures, all his creation to cooperate. Okay. And everybody should recognize that. So that is the easiest way. The other thing to, to, uh, when you say in terms of communication, Rich, I wouldn't be so worried about having to communicate with your angel. What I would do is just be aware that your angel is, is there, um, really assisting you in ways, um, to really get you to, to help you resist sin, to make better choices, to be stronger in your faith, to be more committed, to be more focused. You know, they are there. They're uh, really helping in that area. So that would be the easiest way to start. Now, there is, a, you know, an in-depth way, like you're talking about the consecration or novenas um, to the angels. Um, that That is a, a more committed, more um, intense relationship, if, if you will, with the guardian angels. Adam, comments on that? Sure. Um, and... Opus Angelorum, you can you can look up their website a little bit later. They have a ton of good information. It's a Catholic religious order that is primarily based around the angels, and they have a lot of good guidance. But here's the thing, Rich, and this is great, for I think, for everybody to hear, because your question beautifully brings it up. Don't expect your angel to be talking to you in your head. If there are people out there that have a mental illness that's starting and they're hearing a voice in their head that may be claiming to be a guardian angel, That almost certainly is not a guardian angel. That is either a mental illness that's starting or it's a deceptive spirit claiming to be your guardian angel. We are not to expect our guardian angels to literally talk into our head or speak audibly to us and give us direction and guidance. It is rare they do appear to some people and give very brief messages. Um, But that is the exception. It's not the rule at all. Okay, so you don't want to be looking for that. It, it is more of a, they're more going to just be silent there. The, the last thing, and I know you're not doing this, Rich, but there's people out there that might misunderstand. There are angel tarot cards. There are probably angel-related oh, no. Ouija boards. There are people no. selling things to do divination to communicate with their guardian angel or angels in general. You don't want to be doing that. Divination no, is, is, yeah, it's forbidden. I'm more saying it for, for the other people, Rich. I, I figured you got it. Um, but, you know, what you're doing is great. It's one of the ways to build your relationship with God because your angel was put there by God to assist you. Uh, the last thing, Rich, when you're struggling with temptation or you're struggling with something in life, you want to ask either in your mind, you can do it out loud, ask your guardian angel to help you because the more you exercise your free will and say, I give you permission to help me, I'm asking you to help me, generally the more that they are going to do. Okay? It's a no. That's what I needed to know was that last part. Um, okay. I, I understand that they were created, we, we each got a God, we each were assigned a guardian angel and that mm-hmm. assignment, when they were asked, uh, if they would take the task of this particular person, that it was completely out of love for us. That's their nature. I understand that. So, but it's I'm I'm in I'm at this late in the game. So I don't want I want to make sure that I have him in my life, doing everything he can to get me to heaven, all right, and to possibly help others as well. Wonderful, Rich, and don't feel bad. Your your God's going to work with you wherever you're at in life. Don't mm-hmm. feel bad if it's late in the game. Yep. Uh, that doesn't matter. God's grace is sufficient. Right. And just one okay, other cool. thing, Rich, if you want a really good book on this to, to really um, go into the details of the mission of the guardian angels, uh, you know, what uh, St. Augustine said, what St. Thomas Aquinas and, and St. Jerome, and it goes on and on. The other, all the great saints that commented and helped develop the theology of angels, um, go to uh, Joan Carroll Cruz's book, Angels and Devils. Okay. Joan Carroll Cruz, Angels and Devils. It'll really, really help you. Okay. What was, what's her name? Joan? Joan Carroll Cruz. 
That, and she's she's oh, passed oh, away. Oh, she's oh. a great author. She's the one who wrote, uh, put together the Incorruptibles, Eucharistic Miracles, and she wrote Angels and Devils. And it is a great book. It's a very th- a thick book, a lot of material there, a lot of details that you need to know if you're going to do, do this really in-depth understanding. Um, I, obviously, you could, you could dive into St. Thomas Aquinas, the Summa, but I will tell you it is, it is quite um, not, not that you uh, can't handle it. It's just it's very, it's very um, deep, and it has a lot of twists and turns to it. So Joan Carroll Cruz okay. in Angels and Devils put it together in a beautiful way for us to read it and understand it a little bit better so we can just start uh, bringing the angels into our spiritual life. Well, I just got the um, the book by Father Chad Ripperger, uh, Dominions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um, a that's a big it, book. Yeah, yeah, it's a big book, but it's it's I was I, I'm in uh, chapter one, and it's it's just a little like you said that one's a little bit deep, and I'm like yeah. I need something a little bit you know yeah. simpler. Okay, then so, then uh, let me I'll okay so. Okay, so before we let you go, uh, so Joan Carol Cruz, Angels and Devils, or Peter Kreeft's book, Peter Kreeft, and it's it's K R E E F T. Peter he pronounces it Kreeft. Peter Kreeft's book, Angels and Demons. Okay, that one. If you want to start there, Rich, start there because that'll that'll put your toe in the water, and then you can go deeper and deeper. Okay. Ah, okay, great. Okay, all right. We'll do. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Much. You're welcome. God bless. God bless. Oh, thank right. you. Appreciate you as well. Show. Appreciate thank you. your show. Thank you so right. much. Have a good day. You too. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, um, so Adam, um, as you can tell, Adam, we didn't 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 hit it. We didn't hit the pause button earlier, so we are going to in a little bit, um, just so we can regroup and make sure we have, um, because we have emails coming in, we have comments on social media, media. Tim Mateo, our friend Tim uh, asked, had a comment and a question, Adam, so I don't know if you see that on the the, uh, chat right there, but we also have full phone lines. So let's, if it's okay with you, Adam, unless you have any comments, because I noticed, um, Okay. Okay. No comments. Then we're good to go. So let's go to Peter in Buffalo, New York. Um, hello, Peter. Are you listening on the station of the cross? Yes, I am. Okay. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, well, I hope I can formulate this into a, like one question that makes sense. Um, I am not like I'm Catholic, and you know, I but I don't do all the things that I like. I know that I should do on a regular basis, like say the rosary every day and go to mass every week and go to, I, I should be, do a lot more than I, than I do. I don't know why that is, but my question is, I know that at the moment of death, supposedly that's Satan already knows that he's lost at the moment of death. That's his last time to come to try to get your soul, and that's his goal is to get as many souls into hell before the end of the world. Will, since I'm not, you know, doing the, ro- singing the rosary, you know, seven days a week and, and all that, and, 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 I'm, and I need to improve everything, will Mary still intercede if I just call upon her as far as, like, helping me with the devil at that time of death and or also intercede with talking to her son you know it, it, as far as like what will happen to my soul for all of them. okay peter so so first off um the rosary is just a devotional prayer it's not required that you say it it's just really helpful in in the spiritual journey if you're not saying it that's okay it's not required and i would say peter i know the rosary in the beginning seems like a lot maybe just say one decade of it a day to start and see if you can build that habit take a take it in little bites now mary loves all of us all of humanity as her children she will she intercedes for all of us regardless now how much that intercession we don't know not everything is revealed to us but don't despair of not receiving help if you're sincerely calling on help and also peter i would not so much focus on the devil at the time of death but focus on jesus and your relationship with him 
and your particular judgment at that time. And what I mean by that is try to be in a state of grace when you die. Being in a state of grace is no mortal sin that's unconfessed that's still on you. And that includes going to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. You do need to be doing that. But you can repent at the end. So don't think, oh, I'm going to be damned because I didn't make it to Mass that week, you know, that I ended up in the hospital. You can repent. But it's best to stay in that state of grace uh, just as you move along in life. But please don't despair of things. Please don't focus on the devil when it comes to death. Focus on God and your relationship with God and think about being in that state of grace, okay? Okay. Can I just ask one thing and just to clarify what you just said because it'll make me feel put my mind at ease. Do you, are you saying that you think after you've already passed on, and you are, are there in the presence of Jesus, you're saying you still have a chance to repent? Because I thought once you passed on, like okay. that's it, you go in front of Jesus, and, you know, they say, you know, you send yourself to hell, not Jesus. You know. Oh, okay, so what I meant, Peter, was usually, God willing, we have some time before we actually die. So whether that's in the hospital or during an illness or leading up to the moment of death where we can oh, repent, okay? And the other thing, and here's a beautiful thing not everybody knows, the apostolic pardon that the priest usually gives after the anointing of the sick presumes that that soul wants to repent even if they're unconscious and so the apostolic pardon for their sin is given and so there's a presumption of repentance when we're dying when we receive that sacrament so you know there's a lot of mechanisms there and the last one peter we want to remember we always rely and trust in the mercy of god so never we can never say that person's definitely damned because the priest didn't come and we know they were in mortal sin we rely on the mercy of god it's not that everybody's saved not saying that at all, but we we shouldn't despair. We should trust and hope and pray for the mercy of God, even if you know these things weren't in place when we pass. And and Peter, let me just jump in here because my my religious education hat is going on, and I'm sensing something. And I just before we let you go, because I want you to have a really beautiful weekend and feel at peace. Um, but Peter, I sense a hesitancy um, in your words. It, it, so it, in the in the fact that, like when you said, you know, you're not really quite sure maybe where your position is or where you, or, or your relationship, um, possibly. Um, if that's the case, if you're feeling an unsettled feeling about where you're at with God, or you know, if if God is is you know, if if God is responding to you, or if God's even hearing your prayers, or if you have any type of relationship with God, please. Please, if you can, make an appointment to sit down with a deacon or a priest and really talk this through, not in the confessional, because it's not there's not enough time to do that in the confessional, but definitely go to confession and get in a state of grace. Try to stay in a state of grace, Peter. But I would also make an appointment to talk to somebody at the parish just so you can feel at peace where you're at with God. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're well. You got to be at peace. You know, really, because you don't want to. I agree with Adam. We sometimes we focus too much on, you know, the the demons, and we're not we're not putting our eyes completely fixed on Jesus. My well, my, well, you know, go ahead. Oh, well, I'm sorry. It's really rude to me to speak over you. I apologize. I all I you, the thing is that I just feel like I. I don't know why. I know I know I know what to do mm-hmm. as far as like how to live, but for some reason I don't do it. You know what I mean? But it's yeah. not just in my religious life. It's it, sp- it spills over into my work life and my uh, home life and mm-hmm. all those other things. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, yeah. But and okay, I'm just uh, right? But Peter, that I'm right. like you know, right. Right. But, but see, did you hear what you just said? Because that's where the demons want us to be. They want us to be in fear. They want us to be terrified of what's to come. Peter, let me share something with you. And we talk about this all the time in life coaching. Okay. Less is more with God. Just do something well in a small, in little small tidbits with God. It'll go a long way, Peter. Okay. Um, We're going to have to let you go on that. Call us anytime. 
You're welcome. God bless you. Call us again or email us at tsw at grnonline.com. Uh, you hear the music. We are going to take that necessary uh, break because we're going to see um, uh, and try to get some more calls in here on the spirit world. Please, if you'd like to jump in, uh, there's still a little bit of time. 877-757-9424. And do not forget to like us on Facebook. We're going to post all the resources there at the Spirit World Podcast. We'll be right back. Have you heard about life coaching? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Coaching is one of the things Jesus did with his disciples. Whenever they were stuck, overwhelmed, or even struggling a bit, Jesus asked questions that brought clarity and hope. He then used ongoing conversations that helps them to navigate the path and completely change their lives. Just like the disciples, we too can find ourselves feeling stuck, overwhelmed, and struggling a bit. Maybe you need help in your marriage or with a parenting issue. You're navigating a loss, you want to improve your health, or advance your career. At StandTallToday.com, our experienced coaches will help you to take another look at life, renew your hope, get past those challenges, and step into living abundantly. You can find out more about coaching and schedule a free introductory call by visiting us at StandTallToday.com. Listen, life is too short to stay stuck. Contact us at StandTallToday.com. Did Jesus ever claim to be God? Or did his followers later come to think he was divine, like it was for the Buddha? Critics of Christianity affirm the latter. But is this true? The answer is no, and here are some reasons why. First, the idea of Jesus' divinity had to have come from Jesus himself because it doesn't make sense that faithful monotheistic Jews would just out of the blue begin thinking a man was God. Second, the Gospels record Jesus saying things that suggests his divinity. For example, he applies the divine name, I am, to himself in John chapter 8, verse 58. Mark 2, 5 through 7 tells us Jesus merited the charge of blasphemy by claiming to have power to forgive sins. So, Jesus claimed to be God. That's a fact. But should we believe him? Well, that's a question for some other time. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. Great calls today on the Spirit World, and we are going to squeeze in a few more. So thank you so much for being patient. Let's go to Vincent uh, Adam in Rochester, New York, listening on our friends at the Station of the Cross. Hello, Vincent. Welcome to the Spirit World. Hello. Hello, Vincent. Oh, hey, Debbie. Adam, <laughs> how are you guys this morning? Excellent. We yeah, we're great. We're great. Thank you. So what's your comment or question? Uh, regarding um, Michael the Archangel, um, I guess it's, it's a twofold question. Is, is I guess number one is how did he get charged with his mission? Why do we know why uh, God chose him for the mission that he has? The second part of that is is that we refer to him as Saint Michael, and where I'm a little confused is is that Michael is an angel, and you know Saint. Thomas Aquinas, these are people who live here on earth um, who have become saints, and we have rules for how you become a saint. So how did, how did Michael the Archangel become Saint Michael? So it's kind of a, a, a two-pronged question, so hope sure. can help. I don't know. Okay, so first off, Vincent, not everything is revealed to us about how things work with the angels, but um, so Michael's name is 
we church fathers this is kind of our kind of assumption that we get from the church fathers michael's name means the question who is like god so mikai l l is a reference to god who is like god and it seems that that is in a sense his retort to the devil because the devil essentially said uh, we can take over we can win i want to be god and michael's retort who is like god in a sense I think was what defeated the devil because remember angels don't have physical bodies they don't punch and shoot guns at each other it was mm -hmm. a, a war of philosophy in a sense a war of theology so his his role um, is that action now you ask the question why was he chosen well when the angels were created at the beginning and we get this from Thomas Aquinas the moment of their creation they were given a job a function and a faculty meaning a gift in order to do that job and they knew exactly what their job was to the end of time Michael we know has many roles as an angel he was given many gifts and we have an understanding that he is the head of all of the holy angels so he was given particular charge and leadership over other angels and he was simply created that way with that mission in his mind in his heart to the end of time and he was given a lot of gifts to do it and so we see him him performing a number of functions so it was uh, not so much chosen but created in that role does does that help on that part yep yeah it does. okay it does. okay so when you said and, he was head of all the angels was he head over uh, Lucifer as well or at least at one point uh, that's an interesting question Lucifer is described as as the brightest of the angels in a sense so Lucifer may have been or what you know Satan may have been above him in the hierarchy we don't know exactly but he was the most gifted and brightest of the angels but he fell and so Michael is the leader of all of the holy angels so I we again not everything's revealed Vincent we don't know exactly how no, things were before the yeah. rebellion okay so real quick you then, know more than I do <laughs> And real quick then, my understanding at least about the title Saint mm -hmm. is that it's more of an honorary recognition of his role. And remember, Saint doesn't mean human. Saint just means a person that we are confident is in heaven. Right. And a person can also be an angel because personhood doesn't require a body. It's a human being that is defined as a body and soul in union together a person is also an angel that doesn't have a body and so st. Michael is a person that we are confident is in heaven because scripture tells us so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see yeah I see Thank yeah you he, he, he didn't have to go through the canonization process we, we 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 know that that he's a holy one in heaven so so he didn't have to go through the canonization process like like holy men and women of God like the saints that we know here Vincent so yeah that's my understanding too from the from what I've learned about angels what do you, what do you think does that help oh absolutely thanks thank you very very much I appreciate mm -hmm. the show and uh, keep up the great work Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this the term saint means holy one set apart in heaven. And, you know, that's we know from Scripture, St. Michael is right there. You know, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael. Right. And so, um, you know, yeah, they didn't they're, they're lucky. They didn't have to go through the uh, church canonization. <laughs> right so there you go yeah. okay let's go you got to have a sense of humor folks you just do these are these, this is, these are some heavy topics and you know we're talking about people's faith lives and their spiritual lives and it's really important that we um, do keep a little bit of sense of humor through it all so that it makes it a very enjoyable experience okay real quickly we've got one minute Mary in Michigan uh, Mary if you can um, give us just one minute if we have to comment um, next show on our mailbag we will do that. Mary, take it away. Yes. Um, quickly, I have a 19-year-old, quote-unquote adult, who was a terrific young man, young child. When he met a girl, he just totally changed on us and totally has thrown us out and gone from the family. And when I see him out in public, he is changed. And we, my mother is 87-year-old, praying the rosary, all the time we're both trying to save the soul of this person and we're interested with you're talking about Mary today what else I'm writing some of the things down I'm looking for tips to surround him 
Mm -hmm. Okay, Mary. Um, and I think Deb might have some additional points. But first off, the Mass is the most powerful prayer we have. So you want to have Mass intentions said for his protection and his conversion. Secondly, be patient. Sometimes we have to pray for years for people. It's in God's time. And thirdly, Mary specifically, I would say a rosary with an intention for his conversion on a daily or weekly basis. Deb? Okay, well, Mary, I'm going to have to comment on next week's show on our monthly open forum mailbag show, Mary, so I hope you're listening. We want to thank the show team, uh, Taylor Van Est, Tim Mott, Carol Herrera. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for making this show what it is. It's fabulous. Joe, we'll get to your question next week as well. For Adam Bly, I'm Debbie Giorgiani, wishing you a beautiful and blessed week. We'll see you real soon. <laughs>